Hi, I'm Jim Pathakoukas of the American Enterprise Institute, and welcome to our event today, A New Contract with the Middle Class, a book event with Richard Reeves and Isabel Sawhill. Americans take pride in being part of the middle class. For many, the ability to secure a place in the middle class through hard work is a quintessential part of the American dream. But increasingly, American believes that the middle class has been left behind. From their perspective, wage growth has been disappointing, Services such as healthcare and higher education have become more expensive, and community ties are weakening. In the past five years, this discontent may have helped fuel the rise of populism in the United States, and the pandemic has only intensified the struggles that many middle class Americans face. So, today's panel will discuss the current state of America's middle class and explore what policymakers can do to improve it. Our panel. Richard Reeves is a senior fellow in economic studies at the Brookings Institution, where he holds the John C. and Nancy D. Whitehead chair. Richard is also the director of the Future of the Middle Class Initiative and of the Center on Children and Family. Isabel Sawhill is a senior fellow in economic studies, also at Brookings Institution, and a previous director of Brookings Economic Studies Program. She's also the author of several books, including The Forgotten Americans and The Economic Agenda for a Divided Nation. And Michael Strain is the Arthur Byrne Scholar and Director of Economic Policy Studies here at AEI. He is author of The American Dream is Not Dead, But Populism Could Kill It, released in February of this year. So here's how the event's going to go today. To start, start out, I think Isabel is going to go first and speak for about 10 minutes. Uh, then Richard will speak for about 10 minutes. Then all of us will participate in a panel discussion. Toward the end of that discussion, uh, probably about 1045, uh, we're gonna do a Q&A. So please, please submit your questions on Twitter with the hashtag, hashtag AskAEIEcon. Good luck with that. Uh, Isabel, I think if you're gonna go first. Uh, thank you very much, Jim. Uh, we've got some slides we wanna bring up here. Uh, and um, I am going to start by talking about uh, who we mean by the middle class. It's interesting, if you do a survey of Americans, almost all of them will tell you that they think of themselves as middle class. Uh, they don't like to think uh, that we have an aristocratic elite or that we have a underprivileged welfare class. Uh, it's almost a national ethos. Uh, I think it goes along with uh, the belief in this country that anyone can make it if they work hard and are responsible uh, citizens and members of their families and communities. So to the extent that there's a national identity or a motivating set of ideals, uh, Americans uh, don't like the idea of the uh, notion that some people are more worthy than others. They really have a middle-class mentality. That said, for reasons of clarity and precision, we had to pick a definition in our work, and we decided to look at people with incomes in the middle 60% of the income distribution. Uh, that means people with family incomes between about $40,000 and $150,000 a year. Uh, the typical middle-class family of three has an income of about $70,000 a year. Why did we decide to focus on the middle class? Uh, both Richard and I have spent a lot of our careers studying issues of social mobility and inequality. I've written a book on poverty and the working class, and Richard has written a book about the dream hoarders or the top 20%. So one reason to focus on the middle class is simply because they're a group that people like us have tended to neglect. But much more importantly, I think the middle class is the foundation of a healthy society. Uh, without a flourishing middle class, there won't be the purchasing power uh, to support a strong economy. There won't be the broad-based participation and engagement uh, needed to support a well-functioning democracy. And there won't be the sense of community needed to, to transcend our many other uh, differences in a big uh, country like the U.S. When it comes to what we should care about when we look at the middle class, uh, what their aspirations or what our aspirations for them should be, uh, we looked at the research that psychologists and others have done on what determines the quality of people's lives or their well-being. 
And we think there are five foundations of the good life. Uh, they are money, uh, time, relationships, health, and also feeling like a respected member of the larger uh, community. In each of those areas, we look at the extent to which the middle class is doing well or doing badly, and try to come up with just a few relatively bold ideas for improving their lot. In doing this, there were three principles that guided our choices. Uh, the first was partnerships. We call our little book a contract with rather than for the middle class because one of our guiding principles is the idea that um, this is we, that what we have is a partnership or should have is a partnership between citizens and their government. For example, we say the government should pay for two years of college, K through 14, not K through 12 but only if you provide one year of national service. So an individual that contributes to the country by doing national service for a year gets two years of free post-secondary education. We're very clear that government should have a role to play in our lives and a larger role than now, but also clear that it can't solve all of our problems. Our second principle is prevention. For example, we argue for a focus on health and healthy behavior, not just health care. We want fences at the top of a cliff, not ambulances at the bottom. Again, we're in favor of better health care, but we don't think that health care is going to solve most of our health problems. In fact, the research shows that health care is only responsible for about 20% of the variation in health outcomes across individuals. Uh, lifestyle and individual circumstances are three times more important than healthcare in determining a person's health. Our third principle is pluralism. Uh, again, we are obviously a very large and diverse country, different races, different religions, different types of communities. One size isn't going to fit all. People need and want to be able to choose the way they live. Individual liberty is another important American value. But in a pluralistic society, we have to work a little harder to be respectful of each other. Wearing a mask to prevent COVID is a mark of respect for and solidarity with others. Providing a year of national service is a concrete way to exercise that solidarity or sense of community. I think the other principle that's a more informal and stylistical principle that we adopted when we were writing this book, and I give Richard full credit for this, was we wanted a very short book that people would actually read. Uh, the result is what I would call a long essay or a mini book. You can literally read the whole thing in about an hour. Moreover, the e-version of the book is available not only on the Brookings website, but also on Amazon, and it's free. We hope its price is not an indicator of its value, but we'll let our readers be the judges of that. With that, let me turn this over to Richard Reeves. Thanks, Belle. Um, here's here's the, uh, the book in question. I'm holding it up. Please, um, please have a look. I should say that we were partly inspired by a book that uh, Michael had written, which was also very short, uh, which Jim mentioned earlier. Uh, let me start by thanking AI um, for hosting this event um, and graciously allowing us to be on your platform and to Jim and Michael in particular for giving us your time um, to discuss these important issues. And I'm gonna move on to uh, some of the policies that we uh, talk about. Um, but just before I do that, I just wanna underline a few of the points that Bell made, maybe from more of a kind of personal perspective as a, as a new American. I think this idea of what it means to be a middle-class nation, not just a nation with a middle class, but to be a nation kind of of the middle class, isn't just, it's not, that isn't just uh, an arithmetic uh, claim, it's an aspirational one. I come from a country where the idea of princes and paupers uh, is still very much kind of in the air. And of course, we actually, in the UK where I come from, still have actual princes. 
But there's something about the US which is against the idea of either kind of leisure class and aristocracy that perpetuates itself, or indeed of dependency. The idea of kind of being dependent on the kind of patronage of, of other people um, based on how they feel. And so there's this kind of sense of independence that comes with being middle class. There's something about the value of that. And, and that's, that's why Bell's, I think, underlined this point about partnership. We say in the contract that uh, middle class Americans are not inert vessels willing to be ready to be filled up with good things from a benign state. And there is something in this policy debate, which is kind of too, it assumes too much passivity on the part of, of individual citizens. Um, and that said, we do think that those who are defined in the middle, uh, in the way that Bell's described middle 60, are a cause for real concern. Um, it is not that they have not seen any increase in their standard of living, but as Bell's shown, much, much more slowly than um, elsewhere in the in distribution and somewhat neglected. There's a tendency in policy circles and perhaps in political to focus on the tails. It's sometimes a natural kind of human instinct, look at the tails. So the top 1% or the most poor, the people who are you know, really in desperate straits or those who are just you know, extraordinarily wealthy. Um, uh, but actually there's a whole lot of people in the middle who we think are suffering. So if you wanna think of it in higher education terms, the folks who might not get Pell or very much Pell, but who really don't have much in a 529 savings account. They may not be reliant on food stamps, but not necessarily people who are, in, who are Googling fine dining near me, um, who may not be dependent on the state for their housing, certainly on public housing, but they're definitely not in gated communities or having second homes. And so there's this whole swath of people in the middle of the distribution who tend to get less attention, hence our focus on them. So um, I'm gonna move on to describing a little bit um, now what we do, if you could move the um, slides on for us. That would be great. So um, I won't read all these out, but you'll see interspersed here a few quotes. There's, um, uh, it's worth underlining that led by Bell, we've done some work uh, actually with focus groups and individual interviews in partnership with Jen Silver at the University of Indiana, where we've actually uh, focus, uh, run uh, good quality qualitative work to find out what people think matter to them. And that has strongly informed the work we've done here. That's ongoing work and there'll be more coming out from that project soon. Um, so this is one quote, you'll see others as I briefly go through what we're going to talk about. So let's talk about um, money first, which comes up, and I think it's where, where we might spend some of our time today. So uh, the next slide, I think, gets us into money. So um, I'm just going to show some stylized facts um, uh, around what's happening to income. So this is cumulative income, this is CBO data, so includes um, post-tax and transfers, includes the value of transfers, and this is the top quintile since 79, the cumulative growth of that richest 20%. And then if you move on um, to uh, the next slide, you can see what's happened to the lowest quintile. Uh, this is the bottom 20%, uh, a little bit below, but still decent growth. Very importantly, that includes to a significant extent the value of healthcare government provided healthcare because that is fully included in these CBO numbers. If you take them out, then that line will drop. But then let's look at the middle 60 who are our main focus uh, here. Now, it's important to show that there's been growth in middle class incomes. Uh, those who say there's been no growth, that's just empirically wrong. But it's also true to say that the growth in the middle has been significantly less than at the top and even at the bottom. Uh, and so I think it's fair to say that those at the top have done pretty well as a result of the labor market uh, and wages, also combining those wages into two uh, uh, households with two earners very often. And no one is claiming that the bottom 20% are doing great. Uh, and remember, this is growth from a low base. But nonetheless, it seems that the safety net has to some extent been working uh, in ensuring that those at the bottom do not fall behind. Meanwhile, you've seen cumulative growth about half as fast in the middle of the distribution. So growth, but not enough, in our view, enough to trigger some real concerns uh, about what's happening in the middle of the distribution. So next slide, please. Uh, why? Um, and again, this is work that Michael's uh, looked at and he and I have kind of discussed before, um, but wages are a very big part of the story. And so here, just looking at median, uh, and if you've got a kind of uh, median for overall in the middle, you'll see that it's been relatively flat. Um, it obviously is better at the bottom and it depends on which year, Michael and I have been around this, this many times, but which year you start in and so on. But that disguises a very big difference between women and men. So significant increase in uh, the median for women and something of a drop um, at, at the median for men. Moving on. This brings us to the next point, which is it's very important to understand that in, middle, in the middle class, uh, and this is work that Bell again has led, um, it's really women's hours and earnings, especially that have pulled, that have actually contributed to that relatively modest 
uh, income growth we've seen in the middle class at all. So this, this chart just shows you what, what would have happened without that, uh, which is the bottom line, the blue line. So if women hadn't worked more and earned more in middle class households, this is particularly kind of married couples in the middle, then there really wouldn't have been any growth at all. So to the extent we've seen income growth in the middle class, it has been a, um, as a result of the welcome increase in women's earnings and employment. But as we point out, that may not be in the contract, that may not be something we can rely on continuing at pace um, forever. Uh, and so that is something that might actually begin to run out. And we have already seen something of a drop in women's labor force participation, for example, over the long term. So that's one of the reasons we're worried about other issues. So moving on. Um, this is a famous chart, so I won't spend any time on it, for a famous chart in the Wonka sphere anyway, which is um, from Raj Chetty and his team at Opportunity Insights, which is showing rates of absolute mobility going, going down uh, as well. So I'll move on. Let's get into our proposals on, on money. Um, and again, I won't read all of these out. I encourage everyone to kind of look at the contract, but I'll just give you the, the headlines here are to try and eliminate income tax altogether for most of the middle class. Um, our view is not that it's not enough to say we won't raise taxes on the middle class. Uh, in terms of income taxes, we should be cutting them. Um, and so we propose that actually, if we just to raise the standard deduction up to 100,000 for a married couple, 50 for singles, that would take most of those who are middle class on our definition out. We then pay for that in various ways, partly by increasing marginal rates at the top and not just for the top 1%, but for more like the top 15 or 20%. Um, and then also we pay for it by taxing the three C's, uh, carbon, uh, capital, uh, and consumption. So a broad-based value-added tax, a carbon tax, and then we would increase some of the taxes on capital, as you can see here, uh, and on corporations. And so we're trying to re shift the tax base away from taxing the incomes of the middle class um, towards taxing carbon consumption and capital. Moving on. Um, I won't dwell on these, but um, I should say it's important that in the contract we have some headline proposals, um, but then we also have a series of others which we mention. We, we mention them in a way that is glancing by usual standards, but with heavy references and links in many cases to other colleagues. And I've just talked about the carbon tax and VAT, and that's work that many people have done, including at AEI, but at Brookings, um, the work of scholars like Bill Gale and Adele Morris, are, we've essentially just been using their work to justify some of these. But we're also a national minimum wage of 12, a worker tax credit, which is um, features in Bell's recent book, um, tax incentives for profit sharing, et cetera. So there's a series of other measures which we don't spend very much time on, um, but which form part of the overall package. One of the proposals Bell's already mentioned, which is to try and reduce the cost of college, especially for these middle-class families between Pell and 529, um, and to move to a K-12. So two years, We've, we have landed after much discussion and argument in favor of allowing two years of free public in-state college or vocational training. Um, very important that it includes that too, um, but in exchange for a year of national service. Um, we call that proposal scholarships for service. And we think there is an argument to treat at least some post-secondary education now as a public good, but that that should be in exchange for public service. Uh, so it's free in the financial sense, but it's not free of obligation. Um, we actually want to create around national service this idea that it becomes the norm rather than the exception. We, we, we envisage a, a society where the question, where did you do your service? is something that you ask people in the same way you ask them, where do you come from or where did you go to school? But where did you do your service? And so the person who doesn't have an answer to that is the exception. Um, to make that a norm, and one way to do that is to encourage it by linking it to post-secondary education. Moving on. So I'm gonna go through, um, so this is another quote uh, around time, just another of four, this sense of the time squeeze. We talk about the time squeeze as well as the money squeeze um, and how they're related to each other. Um, and we motivate that with some uh, work which I think will show, which is to show how middle-class families are just working more. We're strong in favor of work. That's why this is a contract, but the average married middle-class middle couple is now working uh, roughly a day and a half extra a week than in the late seventies, largely as a result of the increase in women's work, of course. But the average couple is putting more into the labor market than they were for sure. And so those hours are coming from somewhere. So if we can move on to the substance of the time chapter, and I will, as I say, have to go through these relatively qu quickly now. So here's the, since 75, an extra day and a half, just pointing out that most couples are now dual earners, many couples where, um, where the mother's the main earner. 
and there's this essential account balance. So moving on to our policy proposals in this area, how do we tackle this time squeeze? We've already talked about the money squeeze. One thing to point out is the US is unusual um, in that, uh, so yes, the next slide shows you that um, the US uh, is unusual in that there hasn't been the same decrease in working hours as in European countries. We can argue it's a good or a bad thing, um, but it is striking that certainly in recent years, you've seen this continued decline in working hours for Europeans and not for Americans. And importantly, that's because of the number of days worked in the year rather than the number of hours worked in the day or days in the week, typically. Um, and so that leads us to some of our proposals, which are, um, come, I'll come on to now. Um, so one of the proposals because of that analysis of why the time squeeze, it, it, how it's happening across the year is that everyone should get 20 years uh, guaranteed um, paid leave, uh, not restricted to any particular purpose, but just so that everybody can have some of that time off during the course of the year. We also argue for um, reforming the social security system so that people can take mid, what we call mid-career sabbaticals. It's actually very hard to retrain in terms of time. And so giving people the time to do that, we're in favor of uh, paid leave policy. We've done a lot of work on that, including a joint project that Bell uh, has been, is now leading with Angela Rashidi at AEI on paid leave, um, as well as childcare, et cetera. And also trying to uh, align school days so they fit better work days. There's this historic misalignment between school days and working days in, in the US right now. So moving on. Relationships, there's just one quote, I won't read it, so I'll move into the substance. Um, that this chart shows you is that there's been a significant increase in the number of children being born outside marriage, um, but, particularly, but most importantly into cohabiting couples. Uh, it's not really driven by a rise in single parenthood, it's driven much more by a rise in cohabiting parents. Uh, this is done by education, so the data is hard to break by income, but it shows you that, that you're actually seeing this in the middle of the uh, education distribution, some college, uh, much less so among those with a four-year college degree. It's still some increase, but you can see the numbers are very, very much lower in births outside of marriage. And so those who are at the top of the educational income distribution still typically having their children within marriage, that's much less true of those lower down, including middle-class Americans. The issue of um, having children outside of marriage is no longer an issue for the poor, is increasingly an issue for the middle class. And you might wonder why we care about that. Well, we only care about that to the extent that it leads to family instability. It's family stability that matters. Um, uh, and we see an increase in family instability, which is uh, not great for kids' outcomes. So what do we do about that? Moving on. It's hard, of course, to... Um, and don't, uh, I should, we won't dwell on this, but um, this is relevant to Bob Putnam's book, which is coming out um, shortly, which I know Bell has been involved in, uh, and the decline in broad social trust. So when we talk about relationships, not only talk about family relationships, but the broader relationships within society and the decline that there has been in social trust um, within the kind of the republic, if you like, which we'll say a bit about at the end, but moving on. So proposals, again, I won't kind of dwell on these. Um, much of this is featured in our earlier work too, um, but in terms of promoting family stability, we're big believers that access to reproductive health care is absolutely critical and particularly reducing the uh, inequalities that there are in access to that so that people can actually start their families when, when they're ready um, and that that will promote family stability. And then national service, which we've already kind of mentioned, which we believe will increase, relation, will increase, increase relational equality um, through exposure to people from different backgrounds. Um, critically, it does look as if, if, if you are exposed to people with different backgrounds, then it improves your ability to work with people from different backgrounds. So in that sense, our separation into different neighborhoods and institutions uh, is diminishing the relational quality of our republic. Um, and then moving on to the, the other themes, which I think, uh, so can you move the slide on for us? Um, oh, this just shows you the, uh, the importance of long-term contraception. Again, an issue we've uh, talked about a lot before, so let's move on for now. Um, moving into health. Um, Bell's already, I think, teed some of this up, but prevention is hugely important. But um, here you can see that the US doesn't do great in terms of life expectancy. Um, there are lots of reasons for that, which we can discuss, but notoriously, we do spend quite a lot on our healthcare. Um, this is reasonably kind of well known. Um, but as Bell's mentioned, we actually think that there's, there's so much attention paid to health care and not enough to health. Um, and so we focus most of our attention on health. And in, within, in that context, we talk a lot about mental health as well as physical health. So the U.S. not doing great in terms of, so in that sense, the U.S. was something of a pre-existing condition when COVID hit. Um, and we do get into some of the issues around the rise in diabetes and obesity, as well as the rise in mental health problems. So what do we do about all of that? Moving on. Uh, again, this just reinforces the point that we're seeing increases in both some physical health problems and mental health problems. And I'll move now on to our proposals in the interest of time. 
Um, so one of our proposals is to start taxing sugary drinks. Um, obviously, this becomes politically freighted very quickly. Um, but there is no doubt that uh, the diet of uh, Americans is having a huge impact on a whole range of health problems, uh, including diabetes. Um, and just the same way that we tax other things that have these problems, there is no question that we should move in this direction following other, uh, the lead of other countries now. Um, it would have a huge impact on public health if we could just uh, rethink our food uh, system. And one illustrative policy there would be to start taxing sugary drinks. There's pretty good evidence that it's effective. Um, but also we think we should push hard on mental health care um, and actually we're kind of proposing to follow the UK's lead here and provide universal access to effective mental health care. The UK now um, without prescription allows access to cognitive behaviour therapy. It's relatively cheap. It's highly effective. Um, we actually want to make it the norm for people to be seeking um, mental health care uh, support rather than only once things have gone very badly wrong. And the trends in mental health care are perhaps the most disturbing ones in the whole healthcare field. Uh, certainly on, on the mental health side. Um, so we we want to really expand access to that by making it essentially free at the point of delivery. All right, the last two. Um, the last one, I should say. Um, we focus on respect. And again, uh, this may not be something you'd expect to find in a kind of wonky book, you know, time and money and so on. But, um, but actually, we've kind of come to believe that actually self-respect and respect for each other are critical to people's sense of themselves. It's critical to how you, what is the quality of your life? And remember, this is all about improving quality of life. And your quality of life is not just about dollars and hours or and healthcare and so on, um, but it's also about how you feel you are treated by other people in society and how you feel about yourself. Um, and so this sense of being able to look each other in the eye having equal standing in society uh, is hugely important. We think many of the problems we've seen recently stem from a lack of respect that's been shown across racial lines, of course, um, but also across uh, class lines too. Uh, and so that ab the absence of respect we think is a very corrosive. So we actually think respect and self-respect are hugely important. And again, difficult to wave a magic policy wand and make people respect each other. But we have some thoughts in that direction, which we hope will at least spark a debate, which I'll finish with. Right, great. Well, that, uh, oh, sorry, one, one more slide. I'm so sorry, Jim. Um, why it matters, and then just give me one more slide. So just to throw these out, why, how do we build respect? We think national service will build respect. We also propose citizens' juries to involve citizens in policy making, um, as well as a few other ideas. One of my favorite ideas, um, uh, it's one I was promoting a little while ago and I have a personal interest in, is having every high schooler attend a natural uh, citizenship ceremony. Um, uh, they're highly patriotic events. And I think that actually anyone who goes to them will tell you that actually they give you a real sense of what it means to become an American. Um, and we think that every high schooler should actually attend one um, and that that would be a useful part of civic education and perhaps help build something more of a republic of respect. With that, I'll leave it and see what others have to say. Thanks. All right, All right. Uh, Richard Bell, thanks a lot. Uh, let's go to Mike Strain uh, uh, to get some thoughts on perhaps some main areas of uh, agreement. And I would assume probably a, a bit of disagreement about that uh, assessment of how the middle class is doing and what we should do going forward. Mike? Well, I uh, uh, want to begin by thanking Richard and, and Bell for joining us today, and, and uh, it's a, a privilege to be to be part of this discussion and, 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 and to be hosting them at AEI, and to uh, really commend them on this on this book. There's there's uh, so much to like about it, um, and uh, it's 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 very short, uh, which is which is perhaps uh, you know another thing to like about it, but. Uh, you know, every, every that, that means that every sentence has has something, um, which is uh, which is terrific. I, I their definition of the middle class, I think, is a good one. You know, in the um, uh, tax policy debates, uh, it's common to define the middle class as everybody below the top two percent, <laughs> and maybe you stop, you know, with the bottom fifteen or twenty percent. But you know, under under these definitions, you end up with around four out of five. Households in the in the middle class. I think I think Bell is right to emphasize that Americans have a middle class mentality, uh, but from an analytical perspective, you know that that that's not a particularly useful definition. And Richard has convinced me in his own work that we really should think about the top twenty percent differently than uh, than households at the median. And so I, I I commend them on their definition. You know, a lot of the things that I like the most about this book were were just kind of the implicit uh, framework that they wrote it in. Uh, I, I am very uh, impressed and, and, and agree completely with their emphasis on both the rights and the obligations of 
American citizens. Uh, so much of the, of the policy discussion, to say nothing of the broader public debate, talks about rights, the things that people should expect, the things that uh, people uh, you know, perhaps are, are entitled to. Um, and so little of the conversation talks about obligations. And there, there is a squeamishness, I think, among, uh, among policy analysts um, uh, and, and intellectuals to talk about obligations at all. Uh, and um, Richard and, and, and Bell just tackle that head on. You know, we wanna give you uh, some uh, 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 post-secondary education free of charge, but you have an obligation to, uh, uh, to, to, to do something for that. Uh, and I think that that is uh, really uh, the right way to think about uh, uh, American life, um, that, that we all have obligations to each other, we have obligations to ourselves, uh, and that we are in, in, in a partnership with, with the, the rest of society, but that, that partnership isn't one way. The partnership is, is, it runs both ways. And I think if we thought more about American life and more about public policy in those terms, that would really, that would really help us. Um, I, I admire that they uh, uh, discuss agency and uh, uh, state that people have agency, people want to be treated as if they have agency. Um, you know, that is a surprisingly controversial claim. And I think one of the most corrosive aspects of the populism that American that, that, that America has been living with for the last five or seven or eight years, depending on, on, on how you want to count it, has been this implicit denial from both populists on the left and on the right that people have agency. Uh, there is there is this this rush to treat everyone as if they are helpless victims, um, and uh, uh, the populism on the political left argues that people are a helpless victim of the big corporations and, and, and the elite and the wealthy. Uh, the populism on the right argues that people are, are helpless victims of, of globalism and of immigration. Uh, uh, but the, the, the common theme is denying that people have the ability to improve their circumstances, the obligation to improve their, their, their circumstances and provide for themselves and their families. Uh, uh, and, and, this, and this sense of, of victimhood. And so it's, it's, it, it, it's refreshing to see uh, Richard and Bell push against that. I am very impressed by uh, their focus on, on, on respect. Uh, you know, so much of the policy debate measures outcomes in terms of dollars, you know, that go in pockets and, 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 and access to programs and things of that nature. That, that emphasis is completely appropriate. Um, but, uh, but I think being explicit about what is typically in the background of those of those analyses uh, is a helpful way for for policy um, uh, to um, to move forward. Uh, the book the book is is heavily uh, uh, tied. Uh, I'm sorry, closely tied to the evidence, which is which is extremely important. Obviously, there's a lot of debate about uh, about how to interpret that evidence, and and I come to, to to some different conclusions at times from Richard and Bell, but. But their 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 commitment to, to keeping their analysis tied to the evidence is 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 also, uh, I think, very admirable. Um, you know, so much of uh, the disagreements that I have with Richard and and, and Bell uh, come down to questions of emphasis, um, uh, and uh, a lot of them, I think, come down to to questions of uh, uh, of, of, of 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 policy emphasis. Um, you know we may be able to do more for the middle class uh, if we cut their taxes and if we, if we adopt many of the policies that, that Richard and Bell uh, suggest. Um, but those policies, you know, for example, capital uh, income taxation uh, would leave uh, future middle class households worse off by reducing the, the capital stock and making workers less productive, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's not obvious to me how to weigh that kind of intergenerational trade-off. Um, you know, I would I would put a larger weight on on future generations than I think Richard and Bell do. But this is this is this is obviously something that can be discussed. There's a trade-off between helping the middle class and helping uh, Americans who are outside the middle class. Um, uh, for example, a twelve dollar minimum wage. 
uh, would would certainly uh, accrue to the benefit of the middle class. Um, but I think that would accrue to the detriment of uh, the least experienced and least skilled workers in, in, in the labor market by reducing the employment opportunities they have uh, they have available to them. Now, maybe that's a trade-off that we should make. Um, uh, it's, 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 it's not crazy at all to argue that that's a trade-off that, that we should make. Um, but, uh, but, but there is a trade-off there. It's not the, it's not the trade-off um, that, uh, that, that, uh, that I would make. Um, I'm concerned about, you know, many of the policy proposals in there for reasons, for reasons like this, but these are, these are the sorts of things that, um, that, that, uh, that, 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 that we should, that we should debate. Um, the book also raises, I think, some, some, uh, puzzles. Um, uh, you know, I, uh, agree with the analysis that, um, that, uh, that increases in, 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 in the wages of, of uh, female workers have, have pulled up the average, uh, pulled, up, pulled up the median. Uh, how do we think about that though? Um, you know, in, in my own household, uh, both my, my wife and I both have, have full-time jobs. Um, it may be that I would, I would be in a uh, much more lucrative occupation if she weren't working. Um, and so, you know, I, you know, uh, uh, if she weren't working, male wages might go up a, a little tiny bit if I were in a, if I were in a, uh, uh, a higher paid occupation, you know, to what extent, in other words, we have a, we, 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 we tend to think of income as, as a household concept. Um, and Richard and, and, and Bell break that household up by, by gender. And then you see the female line going up and the male line, uh, you know, stagnant falling or, or, or at a minimum going up less, less quickly. Uh, you know, how do you interpret that? How do you understand what's happening there? I don't know the answer to that question, um, but but I think it's an important question to ask. Uh, and 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 then I'll just I'll just conclude here. And this is kind of a random observation uh, uh, that I um, that I, I I appreciated the the discussion of uh, uh, health versus health care. Uh, you know, this I think is very is is tied into the obligations. Uh, the emphasis they have on, on 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 obligations as well, of course. You know, we we talk so much about about health care uh, in the public debate um, and and in policy circles. It is not crazy to ask uh, the question of of whether or not health care improves health at all. Uh, I mean, that is, you know, I I believe the evidence suggests it does, and and Richard and Bell come to that come to that same conclusion. But you could you could quite credibly argue that that the effect of healthcare on health is 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 very negligible. Um, that's something that even close observers of the of the public debate would never encounter. Um, and, uh, and 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 so I think that's just that, that that's just another interesting part of this of this book to uh, to chew on. Um, so uh, let me just uh, conclude that uh, I think that there's 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 something on every page of this book um, for uh, people who are interested in these issues. Uh, I disagree with with a lot of it. I disagree with a lot of the analysis. I disagree with a lot of the policy conclusions. But I think the the kind of uh, you know foundation of the book, um, its commitment to uh, discussing the evidence, its 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 commitment to openly discussing the 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 value propositions that 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 that, that, that shape the analysis, um, its emphasis on both rights and obligations, its 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 acknowledgement of agency, its focus on respect. I think all of the these uh, all of these things are are are, are deeply admirable, and I encourage uh, everybody in, in the audience to check out the book. Uh, before I ask a zingy question or two, I wonder if uh, Bell or Richard have a response to Dr. Strain's response. Bell, you go first. Uh, I would just say thank you, Michael. I think that was high praise coming from you, and um, I think all of your comments were pretty much on target. We could debate any one of them, and I uh, don't want to take the time to do so right now. Uh, I think we could get into, especially the first one, about investment and growth. Uh, just make one quick point there. Uh, we do uh, call for expensing investment. Uh, which I think is a very different policy than a lot of what you're hearing discussed on the campaign trail and elsewhere. Uh, everybody's talking about raising the corporate, not everybody, but you know, uh, uh, the person who is uh, 
most likely to become president, according to the polls right now, is talking about raising the corporate income tax to 28%. We raise it to 25, but we expense all investment. Just make that one quick point. Uh, let me add my thanks and make one point too in order to leave time. But I, uh, I love the fact you've drawn out the issue of trade-offs, Michael. It's something that we kind of believe very strongly is important to be front and center about. There are very few public policies that don't create losers and you're making trade-offs. And your example of the minimum wage is a great example. It's like, who is it going to help? Who is it not going to help? Is that the right decision? And, and get away from a situation where either the minimum wage is just a job-killing disaster that can't do any good for the labor market or... Um, is just going to you know, lift, magically lift lots of people's wages without any impact at all on lower skilled. Of course, there's a trade-off. Um, and I think our whole public policy debate will be significantly improved if we can all get ourselves to a place where we could admit the downside of our policy proposal without that somehow de de dealing ourselves a killer blow. And we have to sort of pretend in some sort of magical world where there are policies without losers. All of our policies create losers. We just happen to think that they create more or more deserving winners. Um, and that's the right conversation. All right. Uh, uh, in about oh, uh, a few minutes or so, we're going to try to take a few uh, uh, questions from the audience and from viewers. But I, I do have a question. Is there a consensus on what has caused sort of the negative economic changes for the middle class? Uh, is it is it some of the weak wage growth? Is it, is it a question of weak productivity? Is it a question to uh, less uh, bargaining power? Is it a productivity issue? Is it a power, uh, a, uh, a bargaining power issue? Is there a consensus on that? Whoever wants no. to answer. No, there, there isn't a consensus on that on this panel, for sure. And in some ways, you know, you've got the right people. Uh, so I'll have a quick go. Um, I think that, that, that we'll all admit that, that the two big things that are going to affect wages are productivity and power. Um, and so productivity is going to be obviously what, what the worker brings to the table um, and to what extent that translates into wages. Uh, and the other is what's their bargaining position with regard to the employer, right? Um, and I think the difference is going to be one of emphasis, right? I suspect, you know, what Michael would say is this is largely a productivity story. If you want to get wages up, you're going to have to make people more productive. Um, and there are some power issues too. I don't give you the, he'd be the first, I think, to say, look, of course, power matters. Whereas we would come at this and say, actually, in recent years, we think that power has become a much bigger part of the story. It's not that productivity doesn't matter, but actually, if you look at worker bargaining power um, and even power within the market, the way that some companies, because they do well, are able to pay their workers more. So it's not just worker versus employer, it's, it's employer versus employer. And those changing power dynamics within the labor market and within the product market uh, are a really big part of the story, we believe, um, and that we have to address uh, directly. But I'm happy to, I mean, Michael, has, uh, if I've misrepresented your view, please jump in. No, you, you haven't misrepresented my view. I, uh, you know, I, I think, the, I think the, the, the labor market, particularly for the, the types of workers that, um, that, that Richard and Bell discuss in their books, is, is mostly competitive, uh, by which I mean that the principle uh, and really, you know, overwhelming determinant of, of, of wages is, is productivity. Um, this is, I think, you know, borne out in, in uh, uh, some recent studies that, that do a pretty good job getting at this question. Obviously, this is a very difficult question to get at because it is nearly impossible to observe worker level productivity. Um, so, you know, the, the, the ideal thing you would do is you would, you would you know, get you know, 10,000 workers and look at the productivity of each worker and look at the wages of each worker and see, you know, what that, what that looks like. Um, uh, but you can't, you can't observe wages. You cannot observe productivity. Uh, uh, you know, parenthetically, it's, it's quite common for economists to use a worker's wage as a measure of his, of, 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 of his or her productivity, which should, which should, you know, tell you how kind of deeply ingrained that, that idea is. Um, but there are ways of getting around this. You can look at uh, wages and productivity by kind of detailed industry uh, uh, categorization. Um, uh, you can look at macroeconomic wages and macroeconomic productivity. And I think that the, the economists who've studied this in recent years come to the conclusion that, that, that wages are uh, 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 by and large determined by productivity. Um, of course, you know, productivity sets the baseline, um, but, you know, issues like power dynamics, like the kind of quality of the firm you work at, you know, these sorts of things can can push wages above or below that productivity baseline. 
um, and whether or not the deviations around the productivity baseline are increasing uh, is, I think, a, 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 an interesting question. Um, but uh, you know, if you if you want to do one th thing to raise wages, and I think Richard and Bell's analysis uh, agrees with this, um, you want to increase the the skills and and human capital of workers. Uh, uh, we could we could return to the unionization rates of uh, uh, of the past, and that would do less for worker wages than increasing uh, their skills, increasing the amount of education and training they have. Um, uh, All right. Um, I do have a response to any of that. Jump in, or else I'll, I'll ask a question. All right, now I'll ask a question. Uh, uh, Richard Bell, a, a lot of proposals, there's a lot of things you want government to do that's not currently doing. Has the pandemic made you more or less confident uh, about the quality of American governance to be able to pull off a rather expansive agenda? Uh, I will start on that. Um, I think that one of the other principles that we didn't actually pull out or discuss, but that is to some extent threaded through our proposals is what I would call keep it simple. Uh, you know, the people at the Scannon Center like to talk about kleptocracy, and the fact that if government tries to do everything uh, in a very intrusive way with all kinds of rules, with different rules for different groups and different parts of our lives, um, it's going to not do a great job. Um, that one of the reasons, therefore, to just simply eliminate um, income taxes for most of the middle class and tax some other things instead is because all the other ideas that are out there for tax reform, which have a lot of merit, um, are very complicated. For example, there are a lot of proposals on the table now to um, change deductions into tax credits. Uh, you know, let's have a first time home buyers tax credit instead of a mortgage interest deduction, or let's uh, tax um, retirement savings, uh, but at 28% instead of your top marginal rate or instead of not taxing them at all. It all gets very complicated. So I think one of the ways to uh, think about government is to keep it simple, stupid, uh, and as well as respectful of individual differences and the complexities of people's lives and of business itself. I think you know you can have good smart regulation and you can have regulation that is overly complicated and not well designed. Uh, so I think really worrying about how government intervenes is just as important as how much it intervenes. Can I just uh, add one point to that, Jim, which is that it also is a leading question um, causing a bit of a smile. You know. um, uh, about how how good has the government the infrastructure of government been uh, through the pandemic? But uh, I think there's a serious point here about the political economy of this, which is there's a slight danger that those who take the view that government isn't the most effective way to bring about changes are incentivized to weaken government. Um, they don't. It's, it's not if you're if you if you're basically not in favor of much government policy, then it doesn't trouble you if government's not very effective. I'm not suggesting that's true of anyone at AI or Brookings uh, for a moment, but there's a bit of a vicious circle there, which is you can end up saying, well, look, look how terrible the IRS is at collecting, uh, collecting tax. Look how awful, public, you know, do we really want to spend more money on this broken, broken system, this broken machine? And the answer to that for a lot of people will be like, no, but who broke it? Um, and so there is, I, I would say that, that it is important to think about implementation and the quality of governance and the ability to actually do these things well. <laughs> Um, and perhaps there's a tendency on the left to just assume that you pass the law and the money flows and all will be well. 
the system that magically it'll all happen but there may be a bit of a tendency on the right sometimes to actually pay insufficient attention to that very question which is the quality of governance um, because some on the right uh, actually will get some benefit from that because then they can point to the inefficiency of government as a reason not to fund government uh, and that's a dangerous vicious circle uh I have a, uh, I have a, I have another question, but I, I promised that I would ask an audience question, and we, and we, and we have one. Um, here's the question: Is there a danger that by totally eliminating uh, the income tax for so many Americans, we will weaken uh, their feeling that they are citizens with responsibilities to the nation? I'll just you know, quickly answer this one. <laughs> and let, and let Bell, 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 Bell can go too, but I uh, just very quickly. There's this uh, uh, incredible confusion between paying income taxes and paying taxes. And you know, around half of households already don't pay income taxes. I don't think that, that the lack of an income tax payment uh, makes them feel like they're, they're, they're less of a, of, a, of a full participant in American life. They still pay payroll taxes, of course, if they're working. Um, and uh, 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 they pay all sorts of other taxes every time they uh, uh, engage in, in daily life, the, the, those may go to, to other entities of, of government. Um, so I would not, I would not eliminate the income tax on the middle class in the way that that, that Richard and, and, and Bell suggest. In fact, we may even need to to raise the tax burden uh, on 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 the middle class while also reducing um, the Medicare and Social Security they receive. Um, but uh, an argument uh, uh, that 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 they would that they would feel like they're they're less part of part of the the American family, I think, is 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 not one I'm particularly worried about. You know, it's interesting. We have gotten that comment, or I have gotten that comment from several different people uh, recently. That if you don't tax the middle class, they won't feel uh, like they're part of uh, our society, and that they're responsible for what goes on. And like you, Michael, I have a similar uh, response. I think most people do not realize that two thirds of Americans pay more in payroll taxes than they do in income taxes. So when you eliminate uh, or come close to eliminating income taxes for the middle class, you're not eliminating taxes at all. And of course, we also argue for substituting other taxes that we think would work uh, better and achieve other objectives. So I very much agree with your with your answer. I think that we, we will tax the middle class, we'll tax their consumption and we'll tax their carbon emissions right. and so on too. But but um, it's, I wanna make two points. One is um, around this kind of income tax cut. I think one of the distinctions is, is this sense of urgency that we feel around some of these proposals. And I think Michael's made the point that actually some of these, you know, how, what's the time frame here? We actually, and it's only occurring to me now, really, I think that some of these proposals, like the income tax cut, are very quick. And they're designed, we think there is a sense of urgency around the economic condition and other conditions of the middle class. This isn't something we can wait 20 or 25 years um, to do. Um, and we think that some of the failure to act more aggressively to, to help the middle class, especially in economic terms, uh, is one of the reasons we ended up, ended up where we are. Um, so I think that might be one of the differences between us as I reflect on it. I will say on the income tax thing, no evidence, just to agree with Bell and Michael, no evidence I can see that people feel more, more connected to the community when they pay income tax. In fact, as a new American, I will point out that it appears to be a patriotic duty to avoid paying income tax in America as much as possible. Um, and so that seems to be the way to prove you're a real American is to find those crazy tax breaks that no one else knew about and reduce your income tax bill. It seems to be a badge of patriotism to pay as little as possible rather than the other way around. Wish it, I wish it were otherwise. Richard assimilating nicely, understanding what it means to be true American. Uh, now, I, I, I'm not an expert on what Democrats think what folks on the left, uh, left think. Most of that uh, I get from Twitter, so that's the base of my my knowledge of that. Uh, and you know, and Richard and Bell, I'm not saying you're political analysts, but how would these kind of proposals sort of be received by sort of the the median Democratic voter? And I, I see th things like the twelve twelve dollar minimum wage. It seems like fifteen seems to be the minimum. I, I would think that things like the, um, the the VAT tax would be seen as regressive. The 25% corporate tax, not not nearly punitive uh, enough uh, on corporations. So I mean, if a, if a presidential candidate proposed this kind of agenda, 
would they, would they be a non-starter or again, I, I, I don't know, do you know? Well, I have a sort of obvious answer to that question, which is that uh, Democrats uh, don't control the world very obviously. Um, the political scientists who have looked at the American electorate will tell you that it is actually more conservative than those of us who are uh, policy wonks uh, believe and those that are activists, especially on the progressive side, uh, believe. And uh, even if uh, Democrats get into power in the White House and in Congress, they are uh, going to need some Republican support. And I think that um, everybody is saying, oh my gosh, well, if Democrats get into power, they're going to get rid of the filibuster and they're going to pass a whole lot of very left wing ideas with a simple majority. I think that's unlikely and unrealistic, although that's just my opinion and nobody knows. Uh, but I really think that uh, for the reasons that Michael articulated so well, that we're talking about a value based proposition here in which government does more for people, but people also do more for themselves. Uh, that it's a combination of rights and responsibilities is the uh, message that is going to carry the day in the end. Jim, you asked the question specifically about the median democratic quota, right? So taking that seriously, I think there would be quite a lot of alignment, actually. Um, clearly, there would be some who say on the left that it doesn't go anything like far enough in many cases, but the minimum wage is a good example where actually we look at the labor market and think 12 is okay as a national floor, but you've got to be careful. And we do say some cities and places might want to go higher, but 12 is, is in our view too high. Um, it would have the back to the trade. Sorry, 15 is too high. Thank you, Bell. Um, because of the trade-offs we discussed before and, and you can't just imagine the economy away and all of this stuff. So, but look, look, if we look who's currently running, right? Joe Biden won the nomination. Uh, and so that suggests that, you know, the median Democratic voter might might not actually not be a bad person to be thinking about in this case. Uh, I didn't think the median Republican voter might not recoil from all of our proposals. I think some of the tax cuts, I think the idea that your kid can get two years of free college, but only if they do national service, for example. I don't think there's necessarily ideas that the median Republican voter um, would be against. And you can imagine a world where John Kasich is the is the uh, Republican nominee and Bernie Sanders is the Democratic nominee and ask yourself under which conditions you think some of these would find a home, right? Um, and I think you'd have a different answer, but as things stand, you've got a relatively median Democratic candidate and a non-median Republican candidate. Uh, and so if we're interested in the medians, I think that there'll be, there'll be lots here for both sides, frankly, to like, and some to dislike. Um, another question, uh, does the panel agree on the trade-offs of, the, of a paid leave plan for the United States. Uh, it, Are these questions from people uh, who've been reading our work because they're very, very, very well targeted? <laughs> I, can, I can quickly answer that question and say the panel does not agree. Uh, well, I, yes, right. Uh, we, we know that as panelists. Uh, <laughs> and so uh, I, I am in favor of paid leave, but I am in favor of keeping it limited. And I'm in favor of um, also making this uh, available to everyone for any purpose. Um, I think that when you look at the data that Richard talked about and you look at other countries, we are way behind in finding the right trade-off. It goes back to trade-offs again between money and time. And we have institutionalized uh, the idea that everybody should uh, work 40 hours a week and more importantly that we have much more limited holidays and vacations than other rich countries and it's time for us to take a bit more time off all of us and then yes there should be some extra for people who have a new baby at home or for people who uh, get very ill themselves COVID is the perfect example there do we really think that someone who gets uh, COVID and needs, um, let's say, a month off and has no sick leave and is working in a low wage job shouldn't get any help? Uh, I think they should. I would say 
say that, uh, as in so many other uh, arenas, America is the world leader uh, in not offering this. And um, at some point, other countries will see that we're doing it right. And I would, uh, I would point to Richard Reeves, a new American citizen, as an example of somebody who voted with his feet. <laughs> yeah, but uh, let me let me assure you, my I didn't come here for the paid leave policy. I waited till my kids were pretty old before before coming. Again, this is a great issue of trade offs, right? There, are, this is reasonable people can disagree about this. There, are, there are disagreements within Brookings. You know, some of your colleagues at AEI are more with Bell on this, um, and so on. Uh, and so I just think it's uh, it, it's uh, this issue of the time squeeze and how we help working families, most of whom now are dual earner, navigate the need to earn money and care for their children. That's a real issue. Uh, and it's a growing issue. I don't think anyone disagrees with that. The question is, what's the role of public policy? Uh, and, and is a paid leave an appropriate way to go about that? I think it's, it's per I, I, I'm, I'm with Bell and some of the other, some of the folks at AI on this. I think the arguments against it that Michael and others make are, are very sensible and that we should be absolutely clear about the trade-offs here and maybe proceed with a degree of caution. Um, don't go too big too early. Um, but above all, kind of respect the reasons why someone might disagree with your position. To be against the national paid leave policy is a perfectly reasonable place to be. I happen to disagree with it, but that's the, it's the tone of the disagreement it doesn't, it, it, that really counts here, I think. Um, and we're not talking about a huge change uh, here. We're talking about a relatively modest change. Uh, and we'll see. Let's see whether the, the, the Europe is about to sort of abandon all its paid leave policies and follow the US or whether or not the US makes a small step to following Europe. I would bet on the latter over the next two or three years. It's another you know, would, civilizational I, decline. I, <laughs> I, I would also add that, you know, the idea of aligning school hours and work hours is sort of an institutional change yeah. that we really need to think harder about. Yes, it will be a little hard to pull off because education is a local responsibility. But if the federal gov government provided some leadership and a little bit of a financial incentive for local uh, areas and states to change their policies, to make life a little easier for parents who are both working and taking care of children, it would help a lot. It would also improve uh, human capital, which you rightly uh, emphasized a lot and we emphasize a lot uh, because for less advantaged kids, there'd be an opportunity for them to get some, some extra hours of uh, schooling in the process. Don't, right. get, don't, don't get me started on the structure of the American school day and school year. Seriously, I mean, don't, don't. We have to stop, thank God. <laughs> it's crazy. It's not, it's not, an not an agricultural economy anymore, I'll just say that. Uh, again, the book we've been discussing is A New Contract with the Middle Class by Richard Reeves and Isabel Sawhill. Sawhill. I'd like to again thank for uh, coming to the event and uh, thanks again for everyone for watching. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us.